Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the role of social media as a, a carrier for apocalyptic currents and how ISIS has been exploiting that dynamic. So there are a lot of images that we associate with ISIS. Many of them involve victims of violence, people in orange jumpsuits who are about to be executed or have been executed. This is also an image of ISIS. This is part of their daily propaganda output. They have a, an immense media output that is devoted to showing the creation of a perfect society. Uh, and you know, this is one of the more lyrical efforts at depicting that. But the bulk of the propaganda that ISIS puts out on social media is depicting a utopian society that they are building. They can obviously manipulate this media very well. It doesn't reflect the reality on the ground. But what they want to communicate as frequently or more frequently than the prospect of violence is that they are creating a perfect society which they imagine is the caliphate. And that is essentially a millenarian pitch. They're, they are trying to draw people in for the pace on the uh, promise of heaven on earth. And as we know, we've, we've seen this kind of dynamic, this kind of group throughout history. ISIS is arising at a particularly interesting point in history because technology is changing how we communicate and how ideas spread. And uh, apocalypticism and millenarianism are viral concepts. They have always been viral concepts. They are contagious in societies, but the way that we communicate ideas is changing now, and this is poised to create a lot of change in how we look at extremist groups and how we look at mainstream groups. So I chose the breaking down the walls as a little joke for anybody who's an ISIS, close ISIS follower. That was the name of one of their first major military campaigns in Iraq. But it describes what they're doing on social media. Um, there are some obvious components to this. I mean, in some ways, this is not rocket science, except that these simple concepts add to a really complex series of consequences. Uh, the first is geographical limits. And so millenarian groups in the past, I think, while there are certainly examples of some of them growing to have very large geographical reach, we see a lot of examples of small communities. They're in a town, they're in a tribe, uh, they're in an extended family. And it's because to, to spread the contagion of these ideas requires really a lot of contact and a lot of communication on a frequent basis. And social media, particularly Twitter, uh, allows you to get past the geographical limitation of having to actually speak to the person. And this has, you know, been happening over the last hundred years, obviously. Communication has been shifting, but this is now commonplace. Everybody has a device in their pocket that is capable of accessing this. They can be connected all day, every day. Uh, and they can be connected to anyone in the world that they're interested in being connected to. Uh, similarly, language. Uh, to some extent, technology has mediated languages. Uh, we can get onto Google, you can get a rough idea of what somebody's saying, but more importantly, ISIS has specifically approached the issue of languages. When they put out their releases, they come out in English, in German, in French, uh, it, sometimes in Russian. Some, uh, they're, after they come out, they are subsequently translated into other languages, Indonesian, uh, Tagalog, really anywhere they think they're going to get traction, they will translate this. So not only are you able to cross these geographic limits, but you're able to cross these linguistic limits. You're able to cross these country limits and cultural limits. And they do this very deliberately. It is part of their, part of their objective in attracting foreigners, attracting hijra, uh, and selling this society as, a, as the future world society where race and national origin don't really matter. Um, remote intimacy is something that is a really kind of a new concept. It is possible to get on social media and start interacting with people and to feel like you know them very quickly, even if you don't know them that well. And I mean, some of you, you know, I know some of you on Twitter and, and some of you who are on Twitter are probably familiar with this. You can have these very brief conversations over the course of time on a, on a fairly regular basis 
and it feels like a real relationship. And in fact, it often can translate into a real relationship. When I got started in, on Twitter, it made a big difference in my career because I started talking to people uh, who lived in Washington and worked on these issues, and those conversations became real life conversations. And I started going to Washington and talking to these people. Um, so it's not just a question of a random person on the internet somewhere halfway across the world who has an opinion they want you to listen to. It's somebody who's out there, and ISIS does this, they have programs to do this, it's you're building a friendship, you're building a relationship, and ultimately that sense of intimacy becomes so powerful that you can be talked into doing something that you might not otherwise do. Uh, and then I just, there's a, a particular element of semiotic arousal in these, in these mediums. So when you join a social media network, it's not just, you don't just have a web address, you don't just have a name, you have a picture, you have an icon that's going to be you, that symbolizes something about you. Mine is Godzilla, uh, which is arguably not a great choice, but I kind of like it. Um, <laughs> when you look at how ISIS uses uh, symbology in its social media profiles, it is overwhelming uh, and powerful. So the black flag is obviously one of the most common images and Twitter's current campaign to suspend ISIS accounts has reduced some of the, the appearance of these symbols. But they use the black flag, they have banners that are, that are used, uh, drawn from some of their publications, some of the images that they put out. Uh, they use names that have significance, they use hashtags that have significance, and all of this is, is really, because social media and, and Twitter in particular, we talk about Twitter a lot on this, partly because ISIS is very active there, and partly because Twitter is kind of the, the alpha predator of social networks. It reduces everything to very simple kind of interactions that can be measured very clearly and are very effective at organizing people. So on Twitter, you have a limited number of words, and you have patterns of hashtags, and you have iconography that is associated with your identity, and all of these things just create an incredible echo chamber. Uh, it really allows you to, in a, in a nonverbal way, to, to reinforce just the general iconic nature of what you're pitching, and just to, to invoke a whole series of associations that aren't necessarily visible on the surface. So the other thing that ISIS does that is particularly useful in, in pushing out an apocalyptic or millenarian kind of viewpoint is it moves people who join its social network into apocalyptic time. It's creating urgency. Everything is happening now. Now, now, now. And again, Twitter is kind of the exemplar of this, but we see them on Facebook and Instagram too. Uh, the flow of, of information on Twitter can be overwhelming, especially if you follow a lot of accounts that tweet a lot, and ISIS accounts tweet a lot. Uh, we looked at, for, for Brookings, a uh, colleague and I did a pretty extensive study of how ISIS used social media, and one of the things we found is that there's a core group of a couple of thousands accounts. These are people who basically their job is to go on and tweet all day, every day, sometimes hundreds of tweets a day, sometimes 50 tweets, sometimes 100 tweets, sometimes 300 tweets depending on who you are and what's going on at any given time. Um, so this small group of extremely active accounts really dominates a lot of what ISIS does online. Part of the reason for this is that there are technical advantages on Twitter to doing this. If you go out and tweet 500 times a day with the same hashtag, you might cause the hashtag to trend. You're going to get more hits on it. It's going to show up on a little sidebar on Twitter and say this is a trending hashtag. But it also creates an incredible sense of urgency and a, and a consistency of experience. And any time that you're, if you're like interested in ISIS but maybe you're flagging a little, you can go on Twitter and there's like stuff just flowing right past you to, to, to buoy you up. Um, the second issue is hashtags, and one thing that I thought was pretty interesting in the study, we looked at 20,000 uh, ISIS-associated accounts, and after the name of ISIS, the next most common tag was urgent, uh, and also flash and now. So these are words that signify you are missing out. This is going on right now, and you've got to be part of it. And, you know, there is... Some, to some extent, this is a, a broader cultural thing. I'm sure you see the word breaking on your Twitter feed all the time. But this is uh, statistically higher than what you, you would see in a, in a normal 
environment. So, you know, there's a, there's a certain deliberateness to this, whether they're doing it because they think it's good marketing or whether they're intentionally doing it because they think it facilitates an apocalyptic narrative, I can't necessarily answer that, but it does facilitate that. Uh, the third thing is event crescendos. So periodically, and this is, you know, depends on what's going on on the ground and, and what kind of other stuff ISIS has going on, but they have a very good sense of drama. So what they put out here, this narrative they put out here, even though it's coming in tweets, a uh, little bit at a time, it's like a television show. It's like watching a season of television. And there are cliffhangers. You have a mid-season cliffhanger. You have your end-of-season cliffhanger. There are times when activity becomes much more important. Something really important is going on. And their social media activity will reflect that. So at, as the uh, announcement of Caliphate came up, there was a tremendous surge in activity. And in fact, they had automated some of this. They had created apps that would just blast tweets out at an incredible volume. Uh, to build up to this event. And uh, you can see it when, when I look at Twitter accounts, so I track a lot of these accounts, uh, and what I do is I have a big screen TV and it's got 10 columns of tweets going by. And when ISIS puts out a release, you can see it's like a very distinctive pattern. You just see the release like spreading across all these columns, just uh, becoming a, an event and people react to it at the very base level where they put it out there's this calculated there's a couple of people whose job it is to put this out to put it out make sure the video is available to people there's a larger group that's responsible for tweeting it out and tweeting it over and over and over again and that is contagious it becomes excitement at some point you get out to the third circle where there's real organic interest in what's going on so all of this is isis is i think the first group to really understand the potential of this technology and exploit it and, and to combine it with this really kind of powerful apocalyptic message. But it's definitely not just an ISIS issue. And you can see this uh, on some of the fringes of the ISIS network. So core ISIS people, people who are really committed to ISIS, who are living in Iraq and Syria, are monomaniacs. They don't talk about anything except ISIS. They're not interested in anything except ISIS. And when you see some of their people outside the country, for instance, they're hackers. There are a lot of hackers who have been recruited to help with putting together some of this technology and to do other tasks for ISIS. They're not necessarily based in, in Syria or Iraq. And what you see is that they follow a lot of other interesting looking eschatological accounts. Some have to do with 2012, some have to do with UFOs. There's some weird stuff going on at the fringes of this network. Um, you know, I think that there's Different issues, I'm going to just skip these last two points because it's getting late in the day and they're a little bit of a tangent. Um, ultimately, the internet and social media allow us to institute selection bias at a kind of epic level that really wasn't possible in the past. Um, there is an information overload. If you wire yourself into these networks, you are going to receive so much data that you have to pick and choose what you're going to believe. And you have the option of tailoring the data you get to the beliefs that you would like to have. Um, and that process is easier and easier every day because Google gets better directing you what you want. Twitter will recommend, if you follow 10 ISIS accounts, Twitter will recommend other ISIS accounts for you to follow. It's very easy to get into a channel of information that is much more limited and that where all the data you're getting is reinforcing the idea that you came with. Um, so we also see like it's possible to create very insular communities. So if you look at social media writ large, studies have shown that people who are on social media who use it pretty robustly tend to have a more diverse view of the world and they tend to have a broader, uh, more inclusive attitudes and to be more rational and, and sort of employ critical thinking. But for those people who don't get that benefit from social media, they can move into very insular little communities. And right now, the suspensions of, of Twitter accounts on ISIS is making that effect even more profound. So if you get into an ISIS social network, you are pretty much in that ISIS social network, and you're not going to get a lot of conflicting information. You're not going to get a lot of cognitive dissonance because everybody you're talking to is part of this giant echo chamber. So finally, this is a chart from Google Trends. Uh, and on the left, uh, the blue line is interest in martial law. 
which is a favorite topic of domestic extremists. And the red line is interest in apocalypse. And you can see that there's, certainly there's some divergence here, but there's also some overlap. Well, generally speaking, we're seeing that there's a lot of interest in, in different kinds of views, uh, more interest in kind of apocalyptic stuff. It's possible when you, when you go out and you see what's going on in the world, you've got much more information about what's happening. You see a horrific earthquake in Nepal that's going to reinforce your, your feeling that things are crumbling, that things are going badly. Um, the martial law spike is, is also an example of how these are manipulable networks. So the, one of the, the popular threads right now on martial law is, uh, has to do with a US military exercise called Jade Helm, which is just a training exercise the military does. It's become the focus of an unbelievable conspiracy theory machine. And so one example of this, somebody sent me a, a link to a Twitter account that had been devoted to tracking this, tracking this evil. And it had 20,000 followers. And I was like, how the hell is that possible? And so I downloaded the followers and examined them. And the answer to how that's possible is that 40 or 50% of those followers are Russian bots and trolls that are designed to amplify feelings of unease and paranoia in the United States. And, you know, the whole process of ISIS, and, and, you know, I didn't recap all my previous presentations on this, but ISIS is, uses social media in an incredibly manipulative way. So in addition to the organic benefits that you get for a viral concept, for a viral contagious idea, like a millennial idea or, a, or an apocalyptic ideal, you also now have the prospect of invisible hands manipulating what's going on and, and amplifying problems. And so, I expect that we're going to see a lot more interesting kind of apocalyptism going on in the next few years, uh, and that it's going to cross over a lot of boundaries, and we're going to have to learn new ways to deal with it and process information and look past the view out your window. So it's, you know, when you look out your window, it's snowing, so obviously climate change is a lot of garbage. Um, on Twitter, you look out your window and the people you're following are talking about something, and that it must be a really important thing. Um, you look out your window if you're a reporter, and I've had this conversation with reporters. They look out their window and they see ISIS is, is still tweeting its videos even though a bunch of its accounts have been suspended, so obviously they're doing great. We have to be able to pull back and look at the stuff in a bigger data context and decipher when something, the view from your window is not what the reality reflects uh, and when there's something else going on somebody working an agenda. So I will leave it at that.